Hi, I'm Dr. Jen Landa. I'm an OBGYN, author of The Sex Drive Solution for Women, Chief Medical Officer of BodyLogic MD, and creator of the Rewire Your Desire program, which is a program for women with low sex drive to help them get the passion back in their lives. Welcome to part one of my four webinar series. This one is called Tuning In. In this webinar, I'm going to show you ways to awaken your sensual self. I'm going to teach you how to become attuned to your sensual self and how to gently narrow your focus to the present experience, making it richer and fuller, and how to make a clear path toward improved passion. At the end of today's program, you'll start the first steps toward improving your desire, your relationship, and your life. First, I'm going to tell you a little bit about me and about how I developed what I call my passion for passion. Some of you have probably heard me say that before. So my story begins here. Um, I met my husband in 1992, and we had an instant connection. As a matter of fact, on our first date, he told me I was the one that he just knew that we'd be together forever. And on our second date, it's embarrassing to talk about this a little bit, but we stood out on the street and we made out like kids because we were just so in love, in, in tune with each other, it felt young and sexy, and I had never felt the passion this strong. And even further, I'll tell you another sort of embarrassing tidbit, but it kind of puts into perspective what I'm going to tell you later. Um, in the beginning, when we first, when we finally did get to the point where our relationship became more sexual, we would we talk about it to this day that we used to just lay around all day in bed, make love, eat, and go back to bed. As a matter of fact, we lived in New York City, so we made it real simple. We got takeout, <laughs> so we would we would go eat takeout in we would eat takeout practically next to the bed, jump back in bed, maybe take a nap, and make love again. And we look back on those days with really fond memories, but a lot of you might have experienced the same thing with your partners when you first got together. Lots and lots of passion is the bottom line. So I went into med school in 1992, and I became an MD in 1996. And that's a picture of me back in those days when I first was young and fell in love with my husband. And then I, became, I began my residency to become an OBGYN. That's the training program that you go through to become an OBGYN. And at that point, my husband and I moved into a tiny apartment in New York City, and we set about building our careers. We were each working huge numbers of hours. We were putting up at least 80 hours a week, probably each. And we were just really both very busy and very tuned in to that part of our lives, our careers. Three years or so into my residency was probably about, in hindsight, when I can look back and say that my sex drive started to go. I was only about 28 years old, and that's when I started to lose my sex drive. I, at first, I ignored it, or even more than ignoring it, maybe I didn't even really notice it at first. I was so busy. But I had really stopped initiating sex on my own, and I almost became annoyed or resentful when my husband would initiate sex and especially as often as he did because it had been a really big part of our lives and he wanted to have sex and I didn't really want to but we weren't really talking about it so I would just sort of started to naturally make excuses you know at first it was you know I've, I've been working a lot I'm really tired oh I have an early morning tomorrow morning and it progressed to things like I've got a headache I've got a stomach ache or I've got my period and then somehow I would have my period two times in one month, and it would keep going on from there. My husband, I would say, looking back on it, he definitely noticed it, but it was something we didn't really talk about. It was kind of like the elephant in the room. We didn't talk about it, but we definitely both felt it. And it was when we finally went on vacation at one point during that year that it finally really all came to a head. We went to vacation in the mountains of Colorado for a week, and we wanted to have time together away from our busy lives. And early on in our relationship, 
vacations were the time for us to fire up our passion and to kind of live like we did in the early days of our relationship like I was telling you about. And there we were together in the mountains in Colorado, so romantic, just by ourselves with nothing else to do. And there I was realizing that I had no excuses to make anymore. There were no early morning meetings, no late nights at the hospital. And I kind of, that's when it really hit me over the head that I really don't want to have sex, whether I'm on vacation or not. And that was when I really realized that I, I had to talk to my husband about this. And I had to kind of face it for myself that there was no dancing around it anymore and no denying it. And so I sat him down and we had a conversation about it. And you can imagine that he wasn't really too thrilled about what he was hearing. Um, it, you know, because passion and intimacy had been such an important part of our lives and it had really been suffering over the past bunch of, past bunch of months, maybe even a year, but we hadn't really been talking about it. And for my husband, as it is for a lot of men, now that I've started to study this and have been studying it now for many years, I, I know now that for men, sex is a really important way that they show and feel love and care. And for my husband, it was definitely an important way that he felt loved and cared for. And when I told him that I really wasn't interested in having sex anymore and we hadn't been having much sex, he didn't feel loved or cared for anymore. And he even started to feel like, is it me? You know, is it, do you not desire me anymore? Are you not attracted to me anymore? And it was just terrible. I felt terrible. And I really started to worry and get concerned that he would find someone else, someone else who was attracted to him or something along those lines. You know, worse yet, one of the number one reasons that people cheat is because they don't feel desired in relationships. And I hate to bring this up, but this is what was going through my head. You know, would he start cheating on me? W would he want to just leave me altogether? And I was really concerned, but he, I was lucky. He said he loved me and he would stay with me, but I wasn't sure how long that would last in a sexless marriage. He said he wanted to stay with me, which was great. But I was really worried about losing that level of passion that had become so important to us. And it really felt like the death knell of our relationship. At that particular point, I, I'll never forget, it's a memory I'll never forget, driving down out of the mountains of Colorado back toward the airport. As we descended out of those mountains, I felt like we were descending from the high that our relationship had been down to a new sad reality living our lives on this new lower level. And the worst part was I had no idea how to fix it or who to even ask. On top of it all, what was really the worst part for me on, on top of it was I was a doctor and I felt like I was supposed to have the answers. During my residency, I had never learned about what to do about women who have low sex drive. I thought about all the doctors who had taught me, my chief residents, the attending physicians, and nobody even really talked about it at all. Nobody even mentioned about sex drive or how to help women with low sex drive, and there weren't any treatments that I was aware of. And I was, I was frankly, I was afraid for my marriage, and I was embarrassed to even talk about it with anybody. The only person I talked to about it really was my husband, and he didn't know what to do about it and was kind of miserable about it altogether. So it wasn't a great topic of conversation for us. I needed a solution, but I had no idea where to even start. My lack of sex drive sent me on a journey that lasted many years. And beginning with the solid foundation that I had in medicine, I basically just started researching. And since that sad day, when I descended the mountains in Colorado, so afraid of the future and what it might hold. I have learned what causes sex drive, and what causes it to go away. And I'm happy to tell you that I've become what I think is an expert in sexual health, a so-called sexpert, if you will.
Today I'm here to share what I've learned with you. I got my sex drive back and so can you. That's why I talk about my passion for passion. Now, now my husband, it's kind of funny, all of his friends kid him and they say, boy, are you lucky to be married to the girl that wrote the book. <laughs> and some of them ask him, where, where can I get that book? I want my wife to have that book. One guy even said to him, I want 20 copies. I want to put one in each room because I don't want to make sure she just doesn't lose it. <laughs> so now I want to talk more about sex. But before I do that, I want to ask you, if you've got questions, we have a lot to cover in this webinar. If you have questions, enter them into the chat window that you see below on the left, and we'll answer them during the break. So next we're going to get to sex, which is obviously the big reason that we're here. Sex is a healthy part of life, and it's a healthy part of relationships. It's an important way that lovers communicate with one another, and it conveys love and security for a lot of people. It makes people feel passion, and passion is something that a lot of people say they would kill or die for, and some people feel like they would die without passion. So it's important to get that passion back on track. Sex boosts your feel-good hormones and your brain chemicals. It affects every aspect of our lives. Sex amps up your intimacy and the love in your relationship, and it increases the passion in every part of your life, even outside of sex. And this is so important for people. Sex increases your confidence, your self-esteem, it gives you what I like to call your swagger, it fires up your energy, and it creates passion. Basically, more sex just makes you feel more sexy, and it gives you that increased feminine power. I want you to remember that orgasm is a really important part of women's health. Your vagina is an organ. If you don't use it, you lose it, just like all the other organs in your body. And if you don't get interested in sex, your relationship will suffer. At least it may suffer. And I hate to put it like this, but this is what I was worried about. And a lot of women I meet are worried about this. That your lover may go elsewhere to try to find that intimacy. Try to figure out if they are feeling desired. And even if you haven't thought about it, you probably should be thinking about it. Because if you're not talking about it, you don't know what the other person's thinking. So I really encourage you to think about it and to start on this journey to getting your passion back. Another little area that I should mention, I feel like, is that having more sex really makes your husband more amenable to everything, even cleaning out the garage. With more sex, most people's husbands become a Mr. Fix-It machine without any nagging required. I hate to put it this way, and I don't mean to sound mercenary, but most men like sex, and they feel loved, and they feel happy when they're having sex. The more happy they are, the more motivated they are to please you. The more you feel loved and happy when they try to please you. Thus begins what I like to call the beautiful, blissful cycle. Everything in your relationship will just flow more smoothly when you have more sex. There are two stories now that I want to tell you about. And I want to tell you about these each because they each have the same thread. And they're kind of like what I was telling you about me. Each of these women worried that their relationship was at stake. Each of them had to look at their habits and their attitudes to change their sex drive. Either, and they were worried that either their husband would seek out sex with other women or that another hornier, sexier woman would find their husband. So one patient, her name is Sophie. She's a woman in her 60s. She was a really interesting challenge for me. When she came in back into my office, she told me, I don't even want my sex drive back. She said, my husband still wants to have sex, but honestly, I don't really understand what's going on with him. I think we're in our mid-60s, and we're done. It's time to be done with this. But he wants me to be here. He looked this all up. He figured this out. And he wants me to come in so you can fix me. <laughs> so I thought that was an interesting challenge for me. But she said she wanted to try to see if there was anything that could be done to, quote, unquote, fix her. 
because she wanted to make sure that her marriage was going to be okay, basically. The, so we looked at multiple different issues in her life. Her relationship, she said it was fine. She said she loved her husband very much. Her relationship was loveless, though. It had no sizzle. So we focused with Sophie on changing her habits. We looked at her sensuality. We looked at changing her attitudes, thinking about sex, and doing what I call fake it till you make it. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about that later in this webinar. Stress. Stress was a big deal for Sophie. So she's basically retired. Her husband's even retired. So what is she stressing out about? A lot of people tell me that they stress out a lot about their kids' lives. Their kids kind of treated her as the matriarch of the family. She had several children, and they had even grown children at this point, and they had all kinds of problems going on, divorces, drug dependencies, one even in jail. She had all kinds of issues going on. But she was super involved in the day-to-day-to-day -day -to -day with these. Everybody's calling her all day, every day. And that was something we really had to talk about because if you're stressed out, it totally affects your hormones. And we're going to talk a lot about stress and stress management, and we, I did with Sophie. Exercise was a big thing that she needed to start. She didn't exercise, but she knew a group of, it turns out a couple of her friends did jazzercise, and so I encouraged her to get involved with that. She does jazzercise four times a week to this day and loves it. We also talked about the idea of nipple stimulation to raise her oxytocin levels, and I'll tell you a little bit about that as we go along, too. So we worked on some of these strategies, me and Sophie, and an amazing thing happened. She came to, back to my office for a follow-up one day, and she said, Dr. Land, I can't believe it. We just got back from a European cruise. This was our lifelong dream vacation, and we have not only my sex drive back, but we're having sex again. Our relationship is sexy. And it's not only the sex, but it's the intimacy. She said, I'm, I'm hugging my husband again, cuddling with my husband. And the intimacy came back into her relationship, and she allowed herself to feel sexy with her man again. And it just made such a huge difference in her life and in her relationship. And I couldn't have been happy for, happier for her. I'm going to tell you briefly about another patient named Penny. Penny was bored with sex, and, and her husband was bored with sex, too, unfortunately. They were mainly doing missionary position. She was embarrassed and guilty and afraid to experiment with sex. Penny had a pretty conservative upbring, up, upbringing, Catholic school, and sex was all about procreation, and anything outside of that was kind of considered taboo and bad. And so they always really did had sex in the same way for more than 20 years. And I talked to Penny about just the idea. If I asked you to have eat your favorite food or watch your favorite movie three times a week, every week, for the rest of your life, or for a year, or for 20 years, don't you think you'd get a little bored? And she could totally see where I was going with this. And too many people expect to have sex with the same partner in the same bed in the same way for years and years on end, and they expect that it should still be exciting or fun. But unfortunately, it's kind of not. So we talked a lot about this. And for Penny, a lot of what was going on with her was the habits and the attitude as well. Other things that we look at, like relationship, stress, hormones, those were OK for Penny. But Penny's love life was failing. And she was really worried that her husband might fall prey to someone at work or out in his life somewhere that would fulfill his more erotic desires. And in my program, Penny explored her sexuality more thoroughly. We discussed her concerns, and I answered her questions frankly. And she said it really helped her to receive this type of advice from a medical professional. I let her know that it was okay for her husband to please her in lots of different ways, that it was okay for her to get in touch with her sexual side. We explored novelty and adventure, which is stuff we're going to go into in a future webinar. And Penny's husband, she, she finally opened up and loosened up and added some new things and some adventure. And Penny's husband was so thrilled and so excited to witness her more open attitude. And their relationship became deeper and more bonded. So exciting for her. So now I want to talk to you a little bit about the program, about the Rewire Your Desire program that I'm so excited to bring to you. This program was truly developed out of necessity. I needed it, and my patients needed it. 
every day I have patients who come into my office who have issues with low sex drive. They're experiencing what I went through. Their relationships threatened and they don't know what to do about it. And I like to tell my patients that the best love affair of their life is yet to come and they don't even have to change partners to find it. The information I present in this program will change the way you think about sex, desire, and passion. It'll help you identify what works for you. I want you to know this information isn't readily available. When I teach this information to doctors, I ask them, and a lot of them in the audience are OBGYNs, and, they, and I ask them, do you ask your patients about their sex drive, about sexuality? And most of them tell me no. I definitely don't ask them because I don't know how to answer them. Not only was I didn't find the answers in my training, but most OBGYNs really have no idea how to respond because it's not part of the training that we receive as OBGYNs, unfortunately. I discovered a lot of what I'm going to teach you on my own using my background in OBGYN and bioidentical hormone replacement therapy and my personal experience. And that's how I developed my passion for passion. And I want to share this valuable information with you and with women who need it. I want to empower women everywhere to get their mojo going again. And we're going to do this with a 30-day program that's going to have life-changing insights and practices that will bring the spark back into your life, your relationship, and your health. So we're going to do that with four webinars, one per week for four weeks, and daily emails for 30 days to keep you on track. You'll have membership access to download checklists, worksheets, transcripts, bonus reports, webinars, and your journal anytime. In the Rewire Your Desire program, you'll learn how to tune into your senses, boost and balance your hormone and hormones and brain chemicals naturally, how to live a pro-libido lifestyle, and special routines that enhance your sexual desire. So next I want to talk to you about the ways that you lose your sex drive. Losing your sex drive is harsh, and you can get it back by changing your habits, your attitude, your relationship, your stress, and your hormones. These are the core issues, and they sound like they might be difficult to change, but I'm going to show you easy ways to incorporate these changes into your life. So first, we're going to look at habits. You can change your habits in just a few short minutes a day. And the thing to keep in mind about habits is that our lives are a string of habits that are going on every day, all day. Most of the things we do in our lives, we do because of our habits. So if we change our habits, we can change our lives. Living a pro-libido lifestyle with nutrition changes, exercise, and stress management, making yourself more of a priority, and practicing what we call self-nurturing habits are really important. As far as attitude, remember, attitude is everything. 98% of sex happens in your brain. And women's sex drive is made up of a lot of different pieces. And our brains work really differently than the way men's brains do. We have to learn different ways to become more sensual and more passionate. Women's sexuality is more responsive. And it's up to us to figure out what makes us respond. The typical sexual response cycle that we're all used to hearing about from Masters and Johnson's many, many years ago. It starts with desire, then it moves to arousal, then it peaks at orgasm, and then you go to plateau. And that's the typical what, what doctors learn about the sexual response cycle and what most people learn. That tends to be pretty true for the way it works to, for men. But in the 80s, a researcher named Rosemary Bassan came up with a different model of the way it works for women. And the way it works for women they actually say it's much more of a circular type of pattern rather than just a straight linear relationship. And this circular pattern means that we can have desire before we have arousal or we can have it the flip side. We can be aroused and then that can cause us to have desire. 
Another really important aspect that they entered into with the women's model of sexual response is the concept of emotional intimacy. Emotional intimacy can be a reason that we have sex, or it can be a reason. It can be a reason that we want to have sex. It can be a it can be a driver for sex. So the emotional intimacy is a really important component that really isn't even involved in the men's models. So women tend to be more receptive. We see that throughout the animal kingdom. Men are more, the, the males of the species tends to be the more aggressive one and the women are more receptive. Now it may not be that way as much in our younger years, but as we get a little bit older out of our prime baby making years, so to speak, where we have the urge to merge, after that, Women do tend to be more receptive, but we can learn to get more receptive. We can learn what makes us receptive and how to facilitate that on a regular basis. Your relationship. We, I want you to assess your relationship status, and I want you to do it in a really frank way. Basically, no sex drive for your partner may be due to anger or resentment, and those can produce no sex drive at all. And I see it with my patients as a frequent area of denial, believe it or not. I ask them about their relationship, and they tell me their relationship's fine. My, my husband's fine. Everything's fine. But then if we go into more detail, they wind up telling me that there is some anger and some resentment. And when we talk about it, they're lacking that emotional intimacy that's allowing them to be close. It kind of reminds me of a quick story. One of my patients from years ago, as a matter of fact, she came in complaining of no sex drive, and we worked on habits, we worked on attitude, we worked on hormones, we worked on all of this stuff. And she kept coming in visit after visit, no, I've got no sex drive, no, I've got no sex drive. She would also tend to mention that her husband is kind of a jerk. She felt basically like he was a jerk. And so finally I said to her, you know, is your husband the, the target of the sex drive that we keep talking about? And she said, well, yes. And I said, all right, what if for a minute, it, it, let's imagine, who's the sexiest movie star you can think of? And she said, Harrison Ford. And I said, okay, Harrison Ford, damn fine. So what if by some miracle it was Harrison Ford who was the guy who was in your bedroom rather than the husband and the dirt? And she said, oh, no problem. I'd be all over that. And I said, okay, well, then we have a different problem the target of your sexual desire you think is a jerk. You're not going to have sexual desire for somebody who's a jerk. And it's not only that patient. I've seen that over the years, time and time again, patients who don't realize that it's their anger and their resentment toward their partner that's getting in the way. So you've really got to address that as well. The next one is stress. Stress is the most common sex killer I see. It really is. Stress produces a hormone called cortisol. And cortisol robs us of our progesterone, which is our calming hormone, and testosterone, which is our hormone of desire. Stress causes what we call a hyper alert state. And sex can only happen when you're relaxed. So we're going to talk a lot about stress and how to alleviate stress and why that's so important. Hormones. Many patients come to me and they tell me, I know something is off. I know that my hormones are out of whack. But I have already been to my OBGYN and checked it out, and my OBGYN says my hormones are normal. My hormones are fine. Fine is the word I hear a lot. Fine, as a lot of my patients know, is not the same as optimal. With hormones, there's a huge range of what's considered normal from very, very low levels to very, very high levels. For some of us, the higher end of normal may be what's optimal for us and may be what our body considers as normal. And if we don't individualize that, we'll never feel right, and our hormones won't be balanced. But unfortunately, like I said before, some of this stuff is stuff that OBGYNs really aren't taught to do, and I wasn't taught as an OBGYN. So when you feel like your hormones are out of balance, you're probably right, and you need to get your hormones back into balance. Hormone balance is key to sex drive, and I'm going to teach you to check if your hormones are out of balance and how to fix them. There are things that we're doing or not doing every day that can increase our sex drive. Taking care of your body, your senses, working on your stress, nutrition changes, exercise, and more, all of these are going to lead to hormone balance. 
I've made these changes and helped others make these changes. These changes open the door to your sensual nature. Unfortunately, there is no magic pill. If there was, believe me, I would be more than happy to give it to you, especially if it had no side effects. We need to make small changes every day. These small changes add up all day long to big changes over time. We must change our habits to change our lives. We must incorporate these ideas and techniques into our way of thinking and into everyday life. And that's how we begin to rewire our brains and our body for sexual desire. You'll find that as you charge up your passion, your entire life will become more passionate, more energetic, and more satisfying altogether. I'm a lucky doctor. I really am because I get to have patients that tell me all the time how happy they are. They tell me thank you and they tell me how I've changed their lives and given them hope. A lot of women tell me that I've given them back their lives and sometimes they tell me that they feel like themselves again and that's to me the best reward or that they even feel better than they ever did. I can teach you to feel this way too just by focusing on these different practices. I'll teach you how to overcome the harsh reality of low sex drive. I get lots of requests from women to help their husbands as well. It started pretty early on when I started to do this type of medicine with women. They said, all right, well, now that you've made me feel better, Dr. Landa, what can you do with my husband? Because he's having issues too. And at first I didn't know what to do, but Ultimately, I wound up pursuing additional training in men's hormone balancing and the treatment of men's sexual issues so that I could help men too. Because I wanted to be able to answer the question, well, what if it's him, not me? Or what if it's both of us? Once you help me, can you help him? My patients need to talk about it, but some of them worry that they're opening a can of worms. I think you really need to talk about it. If you've got the elephant in the room, so to speak, that I had in my relationship, I want you to talk about it. I want you to open up about it because that's the first step to changing it. And I want you to be in a happy relationship. It's really cool when you get husbands and wives on the same page. I have a pair of patients who, a couple that I see, and the wife one day came in and told me the cutest story about her husband. And, she's, and, it, and I have lots of patients who tell me whose husbands I never met, who tell me that, oh wow, my husband is a big fan of yours because you've given me my sex drive back and they're very happy with the change. But I had this one couple that I was telling you about that the, they came in as a couple, but the woman said to me, I have to tell you this cutest story about my husband. Her husband's a conservative judge and she said one day they were hanging out in bed and he was just lying there with his hands under his head and he goes, I just love Dr. Landa. <laughs> so that was one of my examples of one of the husbands out there who loves me. And I'm so happy to have helped give them their wives back. The next story I want to tell you before we move on to the, the meat of today's subject about tuning in, I want to tell you a story about a patient named Monica. Monica is a 44-year-old woman, or at least she was 44 when she first came to me. And she works in her family business. By family business, I mean a business that her and her husband essentially run. And for her, that means kind of what she calls chief cook and bottle washer. You know, she does everything from the bookkeeping to the marketing. And she's super busy because not only that, her, she has two kids. And in the economic downturn, of course, they've had to cut back and they had to actually lay off one of their employees, which meant that Monica had to take on even more stuff that was going on in the business. So we talked a lot about stress, obviously, with Monica, because stress, I'm sure, is a big part, you know, and we, we proved that stress was a big part of what was causing her sex drive to go downhill. And, you know, she said, but it's stress, how do I get away from it? Look at my life. So as we talked, I came to learn more and more about Monica. And one of the many examples of ways that I helped Monica de-stress that I want to just bring up now is that so when Monica was she was in the car a lot because she was driving two kids around from one activity to another and when she was in the car she would listen to the political news and the economic news and she would get so riled up about all of that she would get to the point where she was literally screaming at the radio and pounding on the steering wheel and I said wow you know Monica 
what do you think would be the difference in your stress levels? I get stressed just talking about this. <laughs> what do you think would be the difference in your stress level if we were to put on maybe some soothing, calming music, maybe like some classical music or something in the Enya type of category? What, what do you think would happen then to your stress levels? And she said, huh, okay, I never thought about that. That's one way I could change my stress. So that's just one way that I helped Monica change her outlook and everything sort of got better from there. I, I taught Monica a lot about focusing on now, mindfulness, which we're going to talk about in a few minutes. And these simple little changes that I asked her to make every day in her life changed her entire outlook and everything in her life, including her sex drive, got better. Now Monica even gets down on the floor and she plays games with her kids because now she's able to be more mindful, be present in the moment. And she's able to do what I call flipping the switch. And flipping the switch is one of the things that I want to teach you to do. It's one of the things that I've learned to do. And I think it's super important for women to learn in their sex life. So now I want to teach you about your senses. Listening to your senses is the key to opening the door to your sensual self. And nothing could be more important when you're trying to help improve your sex drive. So remember the five senses, touch, vision, hearing, taste, and sound. All day long, your senses are gathering up information and sending it to your brain. Listening to the input from your senses can help you learn what stimulates you. Here's how it works. You receive triggers and you have a response. Tuning in to what opens you up to your sexual feelings will help you figure out what the triggers are and how to have a better response. The more you know about yourself, the more likely you'll know what turns you on. We're going to go over some tricks and tools that I, that I use with patients to help you get your mojo back. And I'm going to help you learn to create a stimulus to respond to. You're also going to learn to work with your partner to find what things stimulate you and use them to help you get sexy. You need to engage all of your senses. So let's get deeper now into senses and talking about your senses. So what's your most powerful sense? For instance, music can transport you to another place maybe. For me, I'm all about sound and I just love chill out music. And if you're a sound girl like me, ask your partner to tell you sexy fantasies or read erotic literature to you. If he doesn't feel comfortable making this up, maybe read some erotic literature if he can't make up his own versions. And other examples are scent. Consider buying him a cologne that you just love or get some candles or some incense sticks that make you feel sexy. Touch. When you get in bed, touch him and he'll touch you back or ask for touches and tell him what kind of touches arouse you. If you're a visual girl, make sure to light a candle and dim the lights because everyone looks better in candlelight. And if you're a taster, what kind of tastes make you feel sensuous? Chocolate? Oysters? Some people go for hot and spicy food and that makes them feel sexy. It could be anything. Be creative with this because it's all about you and what you like. This all about the senses reminds me of a patient named Laura. And for Laura, after her, the last of her five kids left home, she had a blended family with her husband and they had five kids that they raised. Laura realized she had a real problem because most of life had centered around the kids, focused around them, and they'd become the empty nesters. And she realized that her and her husband had a passion problem. They really didn't connect the way that they used to, and she worried that if they didn't find that connection soon, that they might start to grow apart. So Laura came to see me, and together we worked on ways to help bring the intimacy back to her marriage. I asked Laura to observe what turned her on, and she learned that she more easily opened up to her sensual side when she received compliments and touching from her husband. And when she put it together, Laura also figured out what really turned on her husband. And the things that did it for him were his sense of smell and his vision. Those were his strongest senses. So here's what she did. She put it all together in the most beautiful way. Before her husband came home, Laura's a homemaker, and so her husband worked outside of the home. And before he came home, she said even if she was working in the garden all day or whatever she was doing and her hair was up messy in a ponytail and she was wearing grubby clothes, she said she would always jump in a quick shower, 
put on his favorite perfume, spruce up her hair and her makeup just a little bit, and she loved to cook. She always said to me, I'm Italian, of course I love to cook, and she loved to cook with garlic. Well, luckily, that happened to be a smell that her husband absolutely loved coming home to. So he would come home, and he would smell the delicious smells in the house. He'd smell how good she smelled. Then he'd wrap her up in his arms, and she got that sense of touch that she was longing for. And he'd give her tons of compliments on how good she smelled and looked and how the house smelled so good. And she started even lighting a candle every night on the table. She said even if it was takeout, she'd light a candle. And their passion totally came back alive. And she is happy to tell me that they have sex almost every day now. So I want to next tell you just about some handouts that we've got from today's webinar that will help you understand your senses better. Number one, I want you to do the questionnaire about which senses are most powerful. And number two is an exercise that's going to help awaken your senses. So please do those exercises so you can learn more about your senses and which senses are really triggers for you. Next, I want to go into what I call the secret ingredient of libido and sex drive for women. It's called mindfulness. Mindfulness keeps you present in the moment and it ties you to your senses. Mindfulness stops what some of my patients call their monkey mind. Just that goes and goes and goes. And it stops that part of you from controlling all of your experiences. What we need to learn to do is we need to quiet the chatter. Speaking of quieting the chatter, I, that reminds me of a patient of mine. He's a man, but still, it's just a great example of the quieting the chatter. This guy is a 70-year-old guy. And I told him about mindfulness and about the need to quiet the chatter. I even recommended a great book for him, which I'll recommend to you. It's, um, it's called The Power of Now by Eckhart Tolle. And that book is an amazing book because it teaches you more about this being present in the moment. And he said to me when he came back after I told him about it, he said, I read that book and I cannot believe what it did for my life. He said, I cannot believe that for 70 years I've had this internal dialogue, chatter going constantly for 70 years and was never aware of it. So the first step is just to become aware of it and to learn to become more present in the current moment. Most moments we learn when we learn to do this, most moments are good. And if we're not living in the past, which tends to make us depressed, or if we're not living in the future, which tends to make us anxious, we tend to be able to be present and be focused in the moment. And that, not, that makes sex better, but it makes every experience in our lives better. And who hasn't experienced this when it comes to sex? I know I have, I know my girlfriends have, and I know my patients have. You're having sex, and all of a sudden that thought comes into your head like the grocery list, like I need to remember to buy milk tomorrow. Or if you've got kids, this one will sound familiar. Oh, my goodness, I need to remember to put the cleats in Johnny's backpack tomorrow because he's got soccer. <laughs> so those are the last things that we want to be thinking about when we're having sex, especially when we talk about the fact that sex is 98% in our brain. So we need to learn to practice mindfulness. And when you're practicing mindfulness, you know that you're having some success when you have some control over your thoughts, even if it's just for a short time. And try not to kick yourself too much about this, beat yourself up, because you know what? When you first learn to do this, you first start doing it. Some people can only do it for a minute at a time when they start. But you can gradually expand that minute to two minutes, that two minutes to five minutes, and so on. You learn to make love without distractions, and you learn how to do what I call flipping the switch. And that's learning how to be in the moment anytime you want to be in that moment. So here's how you can get your juices flowing. First, you've got to know what turns you on. You've got to know about tuning into your senses like we talked about. And next, you need to get control of that on-off switch. And that comes from practicing mindfulness. Did you ever notice that men have no problem flipping their switch? Men, when they get interested in sex, almost nothing seems to get in their way. I jokingly tell my patients the building could be falling around, down around them, but they're like, wait a minute, give me another few minutes. I'm busy right now. But women, 
we've got to learn this. And I, I always say at this point that we need to take a page from the boys on this one. This is where we can do a little bit of the learning from our husbands and our men in, in our lives. And when we pay attention to our senses and practice mindfulness, we can learn to be a little bit more like them. We can learn to flip that switch and to be more successful about staying, being in that moment and staying in that moment. And there are easy ways to practice mindfulness that I want to talk to you about now. So first, you want to learn to clear the decks. You want to learn to put things on hold. Because you know what? Everything's going to be right where you left it. I'm sorry to say, but the piles of dirty dishes, the piles of laundry that needed, need to be folded, they'll all still be there, even if you put them on hold for a little while. These are some little tricks that I've learned that help me and help my patients to be able to get in that mindful space. One of them is to picture a shelf in the room. I picture it on the other side of the room, but you can even picture a shelf in the closet. Picture it high up on the wall and picture putting your clutter and your busy thoughts, your monkey mind, if you will, picture putting it up on that high shelf and closing the closet door. And it'll be there when you're done, but just picture separating yourself from it so that you can stay in the moment. Another way of doing this is just to write down all of your busy thoughts on a separate list and put the list physically in another room separate from where the room where you're going to be making love so that you can physically separate yourself from your busy thoughts. And try to stop being so cerebral. Go with your body and your senses in the present moment. Some more easy ways we're going to talk about to practice mindfulness. Make yourself and your sex life a priority. So many women fall into the trap of making everything else their priority, and we fall to the last of the list. And that, unfortunately, includes our sex life. But remember, that's your relationship. That's your passion. And that's important. So bump it back up on the priority list. And remember to make a date night. Now, I know you've heard about date nights before. But remember this. It's so much easier to clear the decks on a date night when you can schedule it. Okay, now I know scheduling sex doesn't sound so sexy. But think about it this way. We schedule everything in our lives. And if we don't schedule relaxed time to be mindful, be in the present, and make sex a priority, let's face it, it's not really going to happen too often. And when it does, it's going to be just a really quick thing. But you want to have satisfying, passionate sex. So put it on the list. And we're going to talk more about date night strategies later in the program. Another thing I need you to do, and this might feel a little artificial at first, but I want you to think about sex. I tell women to literally write it down on their list. Like if you keep a to-do list every day of the things you have to do, write sex on the list to remind you to keep thinking about it. You can, if some people don't want to write sex on the list because other people maybe they see the list or something, your kids. So put your husband's name or um, just put a code word. Think about that. And think about, make sure you think about sex a few times a day. This is really important. It's important to do what I call fake it till you make it. Because this is going to help you start to rewire your brain for sex. There's research that shows that we can truly rewire our brains. And that's what I need you to start to learn to do. So we have some materials that we prepared for you on mindfulness as well that I want you to take advantage of. I want you to look at the checklist of ways to practice mindfulness. And I want you to practice it. I want you to look at it every day. Print it out. Put it on your desk or your bulletin board and practice it every day. Also, we've got some yoga poses for you. Yoga poses, yoga is going to help you be more mindful, but the yoga positions are also attuned to helping you open up to a healthy sex drive. We've also got a daily meditation for you. So for those of you who don't know the first thing about meditation, read over the meditation and try to incorporate it into your life daily. So now we're going to talk about how you can combine mindfulness and senses together. Here's an example that I use all the time that helps me to flip the switch and helps me keep it, keep it on until I'm ready to shut it off. I'm also a, a smeller, an olfactory person like Laura's husband. So my husband knows to pay special attention to smells. 
So when he wants to get intimate, he takes a quick shower and he puts on a favorite essential oil that I got for him that I like the aroma of. Mine's sandalwood, but you can look at your favorite natural health food store and find some essential oils that you like or a cologne. He also likes some candles that I bought that are scented with essential oils. And you can do that or you can find some incense or a favorite cologne, like I said, but make sure to go out and get some stuff that you like the smell of because smell can be a powerful trigger. So many people tell me that they remember certain memories based on a smell, and I'm sure you can think about that too. Something that happened 20 or 30 years ago, you can associate with a powerful memory with a powerful smell. So just remember how powerful that sense can be. And make memories that are sexy with these smells that you love. And then you'll find it easier and easier over time to get turned on with the same trigger. Another example in my life, and I know lots of other people who this works well for too, is since I'm an auditory person, my husband made me a playlist of favorite songs that get me in the mood. And when I hear the music start, it's like a transition for me. And that's my signal to become more relaxed, more open, and more receptive. And focusing on the music also helps keep my mind in the moment. So it's good to have a sensory focus to focus on that'll help you stay in that mood and in that moment. It keeps your mind from straying to other things that aren't so important right in that moment. These triggers, and if you teach your partner to use the triggers, are also a great silent language that you can use to communicate with your partner. So for me and my husband, he uses it as a way to communicate with me that he's interested, he's in the mood, and I can respond and be receptive to that. I find a lot of women, we need those transitions, those cues, those triggers to become receptive. And I had mentioned this a little earlier before, and this is something that is a little embarrassing, but you know, I think it makes it more real when I tell you some of my experiences too is that my husband will tell me about fantasies and stories while we make love, and that can make the experience so much more intense. It keeps me present in the moment, and you might want to teach your partner how to do that. So make a sexy playlist of the things that your partner can do to help you flip your switch. So now I want to ask you again, if you have any questions, enter them into the chat window now. And we'll take a break right here to see if you have any questions and if I can answer any for you. So my producer's helping me out a little bit with this. One of the questions that we got is, can you have an orgasm over 50? I am so glad you asked that question because the answer is a resounding, resounding, yes, totally. Okay. There was a study that just came out in January, and it was a follow-up to a study called the Rancho Bernardo study. Not so important what it's called, but anyway, they pulled women from 40s to 80s, and they asked them all about their sex life. The really interesting thing about this study was that, so the average age of the women in the study was over 60, and what the women reported was that although a lot of them had a drop in their desire, their natural desire, so many of them were still having satisfying, intimate sex. And I'm telling you, that was women into their 80s. And they did specifically ask the question, do you still orgasm? And a large majority, believe it or not, a big majority of the women over 60 through 80s said, yes, they still have orgasms. So it's not necessarily all about the desire, but it's about getting there and still having that satisfying sex. And yes, you can totally, definitely have orgasms after 50. So I'm really glad we got that question and that I was able to answer that. So are there any other questions that are burning right now? <laughs> mm-hmm. Oh, that's a really great question. I'm glad we got that question too. The question was, um, from a person who said they don't have really sensitive nipples, how can they increase the sensitivity of their nipples? That's a really great question, and I'm glad you asked that because that's not something I was planning on covering. But the ways that you can do that, number one, it's just with nipple stimulation in general. So you can use your hands or your partner can use their hands or fingers to to basically train the nipples to become more sensitive. But something that I would really recommend trying 
is there's a device that you can buy um, online or in the sexual novelty shops, adult shops. It's a device you can buy, and it's kind of like a, a suction bulb. And you put the suction bulb on the end of the nipple. It's sort of like something that some of you might have seen when you breastfed. Um, they do this to try to draw the nipple out for people, women who have inverted nipples or don't have very prominent nipples to help the baby breastfeed. But you can do this with, um, they make one that's more specifically not for nursing nipples, but for regular nipples, smaller nipples, and it comes in multiple sizes. So they have these suction cups, and then the suction cup has a little ring. It, the ring looks just like a rubber band. You place the rubber band around the suction cup. You place the suction cup on the nipple. You squeeze the suction so it squeezes the nipple up into the tube, and then you roll down the rubber band onto the nipple. And wearing that, um, you know, for maybe as much time as, as feels good for you, feels right for you, per, you know, every day over the course of a couple of weeks, what it does is it helps to improve the blood flow to the nipples. And blood flow and sensitivity go hand in hand. So, and there's a device actually like, just like this that you can use for the clitoris too. But that's a great device that you can use to help stimulate your nipples. So do we have any other questions? Let me ask my producer if we have more. Yep, okay. More questions. Okay, so some people are asking questions about the recordings of the webinar and if these recordings will be available for them to go back over. The answer is yes. They'll be available in a membership area that we've established for you, and you'll definitely be getting emails about how to access your membership section, your membership down area, and that will have downloads for you, and it will have, you'll have the ability to view the webinars again. Were there any other questions that we needed to get to? Yeah, okay, I have another question, so one more sec. One last question for now. Okay, so another question we had is one woman said she doesn't even know how to start thinking about sex again. So one way that I would recommend to try to start connecting with it is, first of all, the senses that we were talking about. Whether they're sexy thoughts or sexy senses that are coming to you, just learn how to really focus in on your senses for one thing, because that's going to help a little bit. And then another thing I would really recommend is I would really recommend considering trying to read some what they call erotica or erotic literature. And we're going to talk more about that in a future webinar. But I think that's something that can really be helpful since you're not having natural, easy thoughts about sex. To read more about sex and sexy thoughts might help you get back on track. Now, you might need more help than that, and it might come down to an issue with hormones. There might be other things involved that we'll cover in future webinars that might be helpful for you, too. I think that was the last question. Oh, wait. I think we have one last question for now. Okay, the last question I'm taking for now is a woman asks, she says her and her husband have a great sex life. They spend lots of time having sex. Lucky you. And she asks, can it be a problem that they're spending so much time in the great sport of sex? You know, I don't, I don't think that usually is too much of a problem at all unless, and I, I want to give you this caveat, unless you're using it as your only method of communication. You know, I mentioned before that sex is a great way to communicate between partners. It really creates, it communicates a lot of love and care and special intimate bond it forges. But I think that some couples can use it as a way to avoid intimacy in some ways, to avoid the kind of intimacy that comes with really talking about issues. So if you're finding that you communicate in many other ways on many other levels, then I don't think that's a problem at all. I think you should enjoy it and have a great time. <laughs> All right, so we're going to move on a little bit now to another area that I want to talk about. And I want to talk about stress because, like I said, stress is a sex killer, and it's one of the biggest reasons 
that I see why women's sex drives really go down the drain. And so I really want to talk to you about sex at stress and, and how to manage it and what to do about it. Because sex increases our feel-bad hormones. That's one of the big reasons that stress is a sex killer. Cortisol is the feel-bad hormone that I'm talking about here. That's the one that goes up with stress. And managing your stress is a natural way to balance your hormones. Increasing your feel-good hormones is one of the things that you're going to be able to do when you control your stress. The calming progesterone and the hormone of desire testosterone. So when you get control of stress, you're going to decrease cortisol and you're going to increase the feel-good hormones. When you're less stressed, you're better able to tune into your senses and you're going to be better able to practice mindfulness. So how do you do this? How do you manage stress? Well, one of the biggest ways to do it is to try to decrease the amount of stress you have in your life. So let's start first by figuring out where you are with stress. Think about it and rate your stress. And my patients know that I ask them to do this. Rate your stress on a scale of 0 to 10. 0 is no stress at all. 10 is the most stress you can possibly imagine. And I want you to track your progress in your journal. And I want you to aim for lower and lower numbers as you go along. To manage your stress, one of the big things I find that women need to do is we need to bump ourselves up in the priority list. You need to nurture yourself. And if you don't nurture yourself, you really can't be expected to be able to provide nurturing care for other people in your life. Women are always the nurturers, and we're always putting other people before, our, before us. And putting ourselves last on the list causes stress. Now remember, sex is a great way to demonstrate self-care. And I want to talk more about that with the next slide. So I want you to look at your life. I always tell my patients at this point, to take a pause here and evaluate your life and look at what is and what isn't working for you and change it up. Too many of us take on way too much stuff. See what you can delegate in your life. Also, look at which relationships in your life are fueling you and which relationships are really draining you. Take this opportunity to look at your life. Look at the stressful situations that are going on or even people who are causing you stress, and eliminate what you can. Which activities light you up and which activities drag you down? How do you want your life to look and what steps can you take to get there? These are really important things that I want you to look at at this point, and I want you to make yourself and make your sex life a priority. So how do we do this? How do we get hold of stress? besides eliminating stress as much as we can. So when we're dealing with stress, and to just help us on a daily basis deal with stress, I want you to do something called deep belly breathing. Some of you might know what belly breathing is all about, but for those of you who don't, I want to take a minute just to teach you what, what belly breathing is all about. So belly breathing is taking deep breaths through your belly. So most people take a deep breath right now. When you do that, if you feel your chest heaving up and down, you're not taking a deep belly breath. Now try taking another deep breath, but put your hands on your belly. And take a deep breath, and when you do, feel your belly expand when you inhale like this. And then when you exhale, feel your belly contract back again. That's when you'll know you're taking a belly breath. And this might not come naturally to some people if you've never done it before. It's something you kind of have to practice and get the hang of. But it really is easy once you, it's just a coordination kind of thing that you've got to work out. But it, it gets much more easy and much more natural. I want you to at least take 10 deep belly breaths twice a day. And then I want you to take more whenever you feel stressed. Another thing you can try is just lying down horizontally for 10 minutes, maybe once or twice a day. And when you're lying down, Maybe picture a wave of relaxation that starts from your toes and moves all the way up to your head. Some people like to picture themselves bathed in a cool blue light, which is relaxing. Maybe you meditate. Maybe you like to meditate. Maybe you'd like to try to meditate. One way, if you're, not, if you're new to meditation, is to look for a guided meditation. Guided meditations are free online. All you have to do is Google the words guided meditation and click on videos. There are videos available anywhere from three minutes till any kind of a length of time you want to go probably. 
plug some headphones into your computer anytime and off you go on a guided meditation, which is essentially like a short journey where somebody takes you through a relaxing scene, maybe a scene at the beach or in the forest, telling you to breathe and what and how to focus and focus on being present in the moment. Some people, especially who are new to meditation, might find it easier to stay in the moment when you're listening to a guided meditation. Other people like prayer. That simple activity of praying can help you connect with your inner peace. So find what works for you and do it. More things that you can try might include yoga, tai chi, qigong. Those are great ways to manage stress. Go get a massage. Treat yourself. Let yourself relax. Get rid of your aches and pains. And also, of course, sex. The act of love will release feel-good hormones and brain chemicals that absolutely can reduce your stress. So this is an odd way, maybe, for some of you, if you've never heard this before, to reduce stress. Getting rid of sugar can actually help you reduce stress. So what do I mean by that? So most people think about stress as emotional stress, but another issue I want to bring up here is something that is really just physical stress. So stress on your body. Stress on your body is another type of stress that also raises that bad cortisol hormone and lowers your feel-good hormones. So how do we get hold of that? So I'm going to talk to you briefly about sugar today, and I'm going to talk to you more about it in a future webinar as well. So what is, what is sugar? Sugar, obviously we know it's in desserts, cakes, candies, cookies, things like that, ice cream. So you know I want you to cut those foods out basically as much as possible. But sh sugar, some of you may know this, but some of you may not. Sugar hides in foods that I call white foods. So those are bread, potatoes, pasta, rice, white rice, all of those white foods have sugar right in them so your body converts those foods right the minute you consume them basically, your body converts them to sugar. So what happens? Your body, when sugar goes up, whatever goes up must come down. So sugar levels, if they go up quickly, they'll plummet quickly as well. What's that? That's a stress on the body and that causes the body to release cortisol because cortisol will help you get your blood sugar back up. Your body interprets that low blood sugar as a stress, and it kind of hits the panic button. Your fight or flight response kicks in, and that's when the cortisol goes up, and that's when the sex drive goes down. So an easy way to reduce stress on your body is to help, is to get rid of those sugar spikes and try to keep your blood sugar more balanced through the days. I'm going to teach you more in the future about how to read labels, but for right now, I just want you to know that I want you to try, because a lot of people ask me this question, how many grams of sugar should I be eating? So try to stay to no more than five to six grams per serving of anything you eat of sugar. And also keep in mind there are sugar hides in lots of different ways. Corn syrup is one of the most common ways to find hidden sugar. Corn syrup just is sugar. So if you see corn syrup on a label, especially if it's in the first five ingredients on a label, you need to stop. Don't eat it. So when you cut out sugar, sugar cravings go away really quickly, believe it or not. I know some of you might experience really bad sugar cravings right now. If you cut out sugar and just use willpower for the first two weeks, sugar cravings will go away. And remember, sugar causes stress. Stress is a sex killer. Less sugar equals less stress. Less stress equals more passion. So now I've come to another area, and we're, we're almost finished. I know we're running a little over time, so I want to let you know we're really close to the end. But I want to take a few more questions, if we have any, before we get to the closing. So my producer is going to give me another question that you guys have here. You guys ask the best questions. This is awesome. Okay. So this question was, does alcohol, like some wine at dinner, affect my cortisol levels? And the answer is yes, unfortunately. I love wine at dinner as much as the next girl, but I will tell you, number one, as a lot of you might have already said to yourselves in your head, well, wine is a sugar, right? So maybe that question was even typed in before the whole sugar part. But so wine is a big sugar. Wine causes your sugar to spike. So when that sugar drops lower, and this is the reason why a lot of people might notice that they don't sleep as well 
after they consume some alcohol at dinner. It's because a few hours later, your blood sugar will drop. It will plummet. And that will be the panic button on your body, raise the cortisol. So it doesn't get raised right that minute, but it does get raised pretty soon after is one thing about the sugar in alcohol. Then the other thing about alcohol is alcohol is a direct adrenal toxin. We're going to talk about this when we talk about cortisol in one of the upcoming webinars, but alcohol affects the adrenals directly, so it affects your cortisol levels. So yes, alcohol will absolutely affect your cortisol levels, affect your stress, which can affect your sex drive, of course. So some people think that alcohol and sex go hand in hand and they're going to work really well together. Sometimes one drink can help loosen you up and get you a little bit more open, less inhibited, and that works for some people, but and much more than that, it really does affect you, tends to affect you negatively in a lot of ways, but especially sexually. And can it affect men was the other question. Can cortisol affect men? The answer is absolutely. <laughs> it would be my genuine way of answering it. Um, yes, men are very affected by cortisol as well. Too much cortisol, too much stress jacks up cortisol in men. Cortisol, cortisol affects the hormone of desire, testosterone, just the same way in men as it affects us in women. So stress kills sex drive in men just as much as it does in women. Absolutely. Thanks so much for that question. And I know we have a couple of more to get to as well. So hang on one more minute and let me hear the next question. Ooh, such another good question. Okay. What about natural sugars from fruits? Are those bad? Well, I don't want to call them bad necessarily. I will say, well, yeah, kind of. Okay, what I want to say is that whether it's natural sugar from fruits, fruit juice, or any other kind of sugar, sugar from desserts, candy, bread, it's all the same in your body. So even eating sugary fruits, like um, especially tropical fruits, you know, the ones that tend to taste the best tend to be the ones with the highest sugar. So pineapples, mangoes, things like that, really high sugar content and definitely can get your blood sugar out of balance. Even I have patients who come to me all the time and they say, I eat really healthy. I do a fruit smoothie every morning and I throw in bananas and pineapples and a little bit of orange juice. I hate to tell you, while that sounds super healthy and it has a lot of maybe vitamin C, it has tons and tons of sugar. So if you're wondering why you're drinking those kind of smoothies and not losing any weight, it's because of all the sugar. So you've got to be, yes, you've got to be careful about natural fruit sugars as well. And the fruits that I would recommend the most strongly, and I do cover this in a future webinar, we're going to talk about this again, is berries. Strawberries, blueberries, blackberries, raspberries, those are all perfect fruits because they're low in natural fruit sugars and really high in antioxidants. So try experimenting with those instead next time. Any other questions for right now? Oh, okay. <laughs> so we got a comment from somebody who said, no wonder my husband never wants to have sex at night. Yeah, that might be a big part of the reason. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much for your questions. And please keep them coming. Keep the feedback coming. Um, when when we have the, the membership area, you'll be able to post your comments and questions, and I really look forward to hearing them. Your questions are amazing. I can't believe what a great audience you are, and I'm so excited about that. Thank you. So thanks so much for joining me today. What I've shared with you today are three important pieces for improving your passion, for getting the passion back in your life. Tuning into your senses, staying in the moment, and de-stressing. Watch your inbox because I'm going to be emailing you daily tips and your reminder about our next webinar. And in our next webinar, that's when you're going to learn how your hormones interact to bring you into a state of bliss or a state of distress. Hormones have everything to do with our health, our mood, our sexual receptivity, our loving feelings, and I'm going to show you what you can do to bring your hormones into balance naturally. All right, so now comes your, I'm a doctor after all, so now comes your prescription. <laughs> I want you, first of all, to fill out your questionnaire about which senses are the most powerful and learn which senses are the most powerful for you. That can be really powerful generally. 
and do your exercise to help awaken your senses. It's just seven quick steps that I want you to use to help get, your, get yourself thinking about senses. And then I want you to do what I call the sensory tune-up. This is a lot of fun to practice, I think. Take a 20-minute bath, or if you don't like bathing, maybe just lie in your bed for 20 minutes with candles, use maybe essential oils, be present, be mindful, be in that moment, play music if you want to, and you can even masturbate if you want to. I want you to note down which senses are the most powerful for you, and I want you to do this two or three times over the next week. I also want you to practice the daily meditation that I've given you, or use one of your own, feel free. I want you to take 15 minutes a day to do yoga, or do a mindful exercise of your own that you like, like Tai Chi or Qigong or something like that. And I want you to stop eating the sugars. Stop eating frank sugar that you know about. Stop eating some of the hidden sugars that you just learned about. And, you know, think about your sugar cravings and, and chart your progress and see how you're doing with those sugar cravings because they'll get less and less over time. The more you get rid of sugar, the easier and the quicker those sugar cravings will resolve. And record your daily experiences in your journal. I want you to watch your daily emails because that's going to have a link to your journal. And I really want you to think about and note down what's going on. And then I want you to rewire to receive. I want you to think about sex several times a day. Remember that's important. Even if it's not coming to you naturally, you're going to rewire your brain to think more about sex. All right. Well, thanks so much. Thanks so much, everybody, for coming and for your great questions. I look forward to seeing you in next week's webinar. And until then, here's wishing you the best of great health, great happiness, and, of course, great sex. See you next webinar. Thanks.